My name is Linda with Power to Practice, and we're going to go ahead and get started with our webinar. I'm going to go over a couple of housekeeping items here. Um, today's webinar is a functional approach to hypothyroidism, part three of three, presented by Jim Paoletti. And the slideshow and lecture portion of the webinar will last approximately 45 minutes, give or take, and we will plan to save some time for Q&A at the end. So please uh, hold on to your questions. If you do have one, you can go ahead and type it in the chat box. Really, you can put it in there at any time. The chat box is on your control panel and for GoToWebinar, and I will funnel all of those questions to Jim, and he will answer them at the end. If you think of additional questions after the webinar is completed, please email them to Jim. Uh, his email is jpaoletti, and that is spelled J-P-A-O-L-E-T-T-I at powertopractice.com, and that is power, the number two, and practice.com. I also just put it, the email into the chat box. So if you have questions after the webinar is over or if you are listening to the recording uh, at a later date, please email all questions there. We will post the answers to the blog. Um, Jim will do his best to answer each question during the Q&A portion, um, but do keep an eye out for that follow-up blog, which I just mentioned. That will arrive through the newsletter. You can also find it on the website, powertopractice.com. We will post a recording of today's webinar along with all of the questions and answers that you bring to Jim. And so go ahead and, uh, if you wish, try that chat box out. Um, say hi to me if you wish. It's in the control panel there under chat. You just need to hit the arrow and you'll see a drop down. We've also made a PDF version of today's webinar slides available for download from here in the webinar. Uh, to download those, click the uh, bar labeled Handouts. There's just one in there, and then you can go ahead and download straight from that control panel or from the blog on, on the website. You will have all audio set to mute, with exception of our presenter. Jim Paoletti, BS Pharmacy, is the Director of Education at Power to Practice and a clinical consultant with over 30 years of experience bioidentical uh, hormone therapies in both retail pharmacy and clinical practice. Jim is a diplomat in functional medicine in addition to being a former faculty member for the Fellowship of Functional Medicine. Jim also authored the book A Practitioner's Guide to Physiologic Bioidentical Hormone Balance which was recently published and is available on Amazon. And with that, I am going to hand over the screen controls here to Jim, and let's get started. Thank you, Linda. Hi, everybody. I'm glad you could join us tonight for part three, especially all those who were able to make parts one and two or have listened to the recordings. Uh, tonight, we're going to wrap up the talk on hypothyroidism, and if we have time, I'll even show you a case study that um, uses what some of the things I'm going to teach you tonight. Um, before I get started, what we did in the first two uh, sessions was go over where all the problems can occur that cause low thyroid function, the symptoms of hypometabolism, and then some of the things we could do to correct that. And I promised you during each of those I would give you a tool to show you how to identify where these problems are in people. And that's what we're going to do tonight and go over some testing uh, parameters, et cetera. So hopefully we'll clear up some pictures of, uh, uh, of some questions I created during the first two sessions. Okay, first of all, I like this quote from uh, 1931. Um, what it's really saying is, look, the patient's coming to see you because they have symptoms. Um, if, the, if the laboratory tests don't identify where the problem is, it doesn't mean they don't have a problem uh, unless they're sick in the head, which, you know, 80, 90% of our thyroid patients will be sick in the head because they come back with pretty good lab results. Um, yeah, a, a patient who has symptoms that don't improve, then you can run tests until you're blue in the face, as he says, but it won't help the patient, and the patient doesn't feel better. So we're going to talk about, let's run some tests that, that really give you some information to identify where the problems are, and then we can correct the issues. Okay, let's talk first about optimal thyroid levels. What do I mean by that? If I was going to go out and, and start my own lab, doesn't matter what media I'm using to test, um, what I would do is I'd get a 
good number of people that have no symptoms of hyperthyroidism or hyperthyroidism. So no hyper, no hypo patients, people that have all lack of symptoms of thyroid dysfunction. Now, that would be difficult, but I'd try to find five, 10,000 people, okay? Um, and then I, what would happen if you tested each of these people and find out where the thyroid level was, and this could be any of the thyroid hormones, but let's just say it's total T4, you'll, get it, you'll always get this bell-shaped curve, okay? And over on the left is the number of people. So that's the number of people going up, and across the bottom is, is the level. Um, so I asked people, if I was a surgeon and I was going to take your thyroid gland out, and I don't really need a reason to do that other than that's what I do as a surgeon, remove glands, so I'm going to do it. I asked him, looking at this graph, where along this line would you like me to restore your thyroid level with replacement therapy? And, of course, the correct answer is right at the apex, right at the point. Why? Because that's the spot, the level where people had the, the highest number of people existed that had no symptoms. So if you had your level right there, you'd have the best odds of not having symptoms. Now, if you went to either side of the middle, if you went to the left or the right, then you're going to get away from that. It's going to go down. So the farther you are from the center, the less number of people there are that had no symptoms, so the greater chance you will have symptoms. So if you get way down here, you have a much greater chance. Now, what we do at normal levels, we cut off the end, but we still let people exist down here and call them normal. They have a, your, your test result is normal, but the odds are against them feeling good. So I always take anybody's normal test ranges, and I cut 25% off each end and call that optimal. So if I went well, about there and there and just looked at the middle, that's what I refer to as optimal thyroid function. So whatever lab I'm using, I take the normal range for total T4, free T4, and free T3. These are the ones that applies to the actual hormone measurements themselves. And I cut 25% off each end. That's what I refer to as optimal thyroid function. Okay, let's talk about TSH and just to make sure you're aware of all the facts about it. TSH was a test that if you look at it historically, it was designed as a screening tool, only a screening tool. It has never been scientifically validated, useful for diagnostic or therapeutic measurements. In other words, adjusting the dose. It's what's done, it's what the endocrine society does, so they teach everybody else to do it, but it's not validated that that's effective. Okay, so it's not, it, it was meant to be used as a screening tool to tell you you have patient, uh, pay problems and that you need to look into it further. Okay, measuring TSH alone does not convey pituitary function, although a high TSH is probably a good way to look further into maybe potential cancer of the pituitary, but it doesn't really reflect adequate, adequately the function. <laughs> it doesn't indicate anything about the conversion of T4 to the active T3 peripherally in the body. It has no reflection of thyroid receptor functionality. And, of course, we talked last time about things like vitamin D and cortisol that affect the thyroid receptor response. And it doesn't really reflect uh, an autoimmune disorder. So you've got a number of possible potential areas of problems that, uh, that affect thyroid function that TSH is not going to show you, okay? It, it may not be abnormal. Okay. TSH can be misleading and, un and unreliable. It assumes that the hypothalamic pituitary function is intact and normal. Well, I don't know if I'd assume that right away. It assumes that the patient's thyroid status is stable, i.e. the patient has had no recent therapy for hypo or hyper hyperthyroidism. And as I mentioned before, um, when you change dosage on a patient of their thyroid medication, whether you're initiating the dose or you're changing the dose, Thyroid binding globulin changes slowly, can take place over months. And I tell people not to retest for at least 90, maybe 120 days to get the net effect of the change in medication. Same thing with TSH. It doesn't stabilize until your net, net free hormone stabilizes. Okay, so it's not reliable if, if you've changed the thyroid dosage in the last three months. Okay, it's also unreliable with significant stress, illness, Inflammation, how many of your patients have, have too much inflammation going on because of their diet and lack of exercise? Aging, chronic physiological stress, and calorie reduction. Well, right there with stress and inflammation, I don't have that many patients that I can really say, hey, this is a good test. If, if cortisol or stress affects it, and again, cortisol directly suppresses TSH. Okay, It also blocks the conversion of T4 to T3 if it's high. 
It also decreases thyroid risk for smoke, but high cortisol directly lowers TSH. So your TSH can look normal if you have high cortisol. You still got a problem. You still have multiple problems with adrenal and thyroid function. Okay, and again, inflammation. So I, I'm just looking to say there's just a lot of patients that we shouldn't be looking at TSH with any great propensity to say here's what's going on. Okay, so you're not. You're not, you can't rely on TSH for an accurate measure of the thyroid tissue effect, okay? Um, yeah, we've already gone over that enough. Enough with TSH, but there's some references on this slide if you want to look at those. Okay, total T4 serum levels. Again, this is from one of the references. When you have stress, inflammation, illness, aging, tissue-specific alterations, you get a suppressed total T4 level due to suppressed TSH, okay? and therefore you get a reduced tissue T3 level, okay? So you get reduced T4 uptake into tissue cells and decreased conversion of T4 to T3. Therefore, the correlation between serum total T4 and TSH and the peripheral thyroid activity no longer follows. So it, it, T4 levels, I should say, T4 levels alone by themselves are of little use in many cases, okay? You need, I'm going to show you how total T4 is important and why, but by itself, just using total D4 and TSH is so outdated now because it's been shown to be inaccurate under so many conditions, okay? All right, reverse T3. I want to talk a little about this, um, and I'll talk more about it when I show you my little tool that I'm going to share with you. Um, again, you have different situations in which T4 is, instead of being converted to T3, is peripherally converted to reverse T3. Now, normally, if you remember, T4 normally... It's converted to both reverse T3 and T3 in about equal parts, maybe a little bit more of the actual T3. But when you have these situations as listed here, now you make more of the reverse T3. And reverse T3, if you remember, works on the same receptor as T3, but it's one one hundredth activity. So it's a blocker of T3 at the T3 receptor. Okay. So reverse T3 can be useful because there's an inverse correlation to diminish cellular uptake of T4 have decreased conversion T3 and decreased cellular T3 level. In other words, when your T4 converts to reverse T3, it's going to happen when your T3 conversion T3 goes down, as I showed you in the, in the previous uh, presentation. So reverse T3 can be useful. I do use it sometimes. But my, when I show you the tool, I'll show you why I don't use it so much anymore. But you will see this in the literature, okay? And, and you'll have people out there that will talk about ratios of reverse T3 right here. Um, in this article by Schwartz, uh, and Holtorf, which is a great article for talk about thyroid. Um, in patients having sy symptoms consistent with hypothyroidism, but normal TSH and T4, obtaining free T3 reverse T3 and free T3 reverse T3 ratios may, be, may help obtain a more accurate evaluation of thyroid tissue status. I agree with that in a sense, but you've got to remember, if you're reading some something by, say, Dr. Holtorf, and he says the free T3 to reverse T3 ratio should be, I'll say, 1 to 20 or 20 to 1. That is with his lab. Not all labs use the same free T3 normal ranges. Not all use the same reverse T3 normal ranges. So if your normal ranges differ between labs, your ratio is going to be different. So to use a ratio, you have to be lab specific or at least normal range specific. But I will show you a diagram that sh shows you that ratio, and then I'll also show you about how you don't have to use it and why, okay? Uh, the thyroid panel. This is a lab panel that's still offered by many of the larger serum, Venus serum labs. Um, and the Endocrine Society said years ago that certain tests were outdated and inaccurate. And those include the T3 resin uptake and the free thyroxine index. They were good measurements when we could not measure T3 directly, free T3, and we could not measure free T4 directly. Um, but when that was developed, in comparison, the uptake and index were shown to be inaccurate. Okay, you do you take the best you could. But this was this was probably 15 years ago. The Endocrine Society said we shouldn't be running these tests anymore. But the labs still offer them, and this is why. The T, T3 resin uptake does not measure free T3 levels. It's, it's estimating the amount of unbound thyroid binding globulin. Well, first of all, if my patient has symptoms, why would you say anything was normal? It, it, and then make an estimate assuming that the unbound thyroid binding globulin was a normal amount, okay? 
Um, so it's not a measurement, it's an estimate. The free thyroxine index is a calculation based on that estimate. Well, sure, the labs want you to run this panel because they're providing two answers that they're charging money for, that they aren't really spending any money to get. They're numbers created by a computer. So they can charge less than measuring the free T3 and free T4 direct, of course, but they're making a much higher percentage. So that's why you still see it out there, even though even the endocrine side says those numbers should no longer be used. You can't use them for accuracy, and you can't use the tool I'm going to show you if you're going to use this lab. So I, I, I suggest everybody get away from the thyroid panels if they're using uptakes and indexes. All right, so what I'm going to show you is called the thyroid gradient levels. And what you see are four different diagrams for four different measurements. But just look at the one right here in the lower left-hand corner. On the horizontal line, that's where we're going to put the low and the high of that lab's range. So this is reverse T3. So we're going to put the low and high, whatever the numbers are. We do the same thing for total T4, free T4, free T3. These are the normal ranges, okay? Along the curve line is where we're going to plot the patient's result, the patient's value, wherever that lies within the range. Now these two little marks on each one, those are my optimal. So this is 25% of the range at each end. So here's my optimal range along here from dash mark to dash mark for each of these. And I'm going to show you how we use these. Okay, here's the patient's results. I'm not going to read these to you. We're, we're, I'm going to show you how we're going to graph these, but I, I put it in the slide so you'd have the numbers if you wanted to look at them. Okay, so let's look first at total T4. In this lab, the normal range is 4.4 to 12.5. So that's what I'm putting at the bottom of the graph, 4.4 to 12.5. Okay, the patient came back with an 11.2, which would be right here on the graph. So what I do is I draw a line from the center of the horizontal line to the to patient's value. Now some people call this like the upper hand of a clock. So it's that they'd say, well, that's about two o'clock high. Um, yeah, it could be called a clock, often referred to the, you know, it's 12 o'clock high or nine o'clock or whatever, but uh, this probably came from my subconscious when I first drew this. It looks so much like my odometer from my 89 BMW that I'm sure that's where it originated in my subconscious. But anyway, so that's that's how we measure total to four. Now, total to four, as I explained before, is a good way of measuring endogenous thyroid production. Okay, so if a patient's not on any therapy and you want to see are they making thyroid hormone, total to four is the best measurement. You can use free T4, and if T, free T4 comes up optimal, it's pretty safe to say, okay, if free T4 is optimal and total T4 is going to be good too. But if free T4 is less than optimal, then the question is, is it because I'm not producing enough, or am I binding too much, or both? So I always feel good, at least initially, to do a total T4 and say, let's look at what the patient's producing. Now, of course, if they're on therapy, that changes, but this will give you a reflection of where is your therapy providing the value? Is it higher or lower than optimal, or is it right where you want it? Okay, now what we do, here's, here's all four of the patient's results graphed out the same way. So 3T4 was the normal range of 0.73 to 1.95. And the patient's 1.48 ends up right there. So the clock in is what, about one o'clock. There you see reverse T3 and free T3. So what does this do for you? This is what we're gonna do. You don't look at all four of them at once, okay? Again, you look at total T4 by itself to see where you're producing. But if you wanna look at binding, that's where we're gonna compare the total T4 to the free T4. Total T4 is the bound and unbound. And of course, this is the free T4, the unbound, okay? Now, let me go back a slide. Now, I think it's less confusing to go this way. Here's a theory. These normal ranges have all been developed supposedly in the same group of individuals that have no symptoms. If they have no symptoms, it's assumed they have normal everything, okay? Normal binding, normal conversion, normal production, because they have no symptoms. So if the total T4 was exactly in the middle at 8.4, I can't went up to 12 o'clock, then in theory, if everything is normal, free T4 should be right there at 1.34 at the same spot. In other words, the clock hand should point at the same direction. If total T4 was down here right about 7, free T4 should point that way too, be right about there. So what you can do by comparing where they are, you can determine whether the person is excessively binding comparing the total and the free. 
Okay, so let's make this easier and put them again. If this is the direction of the hand, the Tolte four is pointing. That's where the free T four should be, right there, where the dotted line is. Same direction. Okay, if I put them on the same graph, here's a direct comparison. Here's where the Tolte four is within its range. Forget the numbers. This is where it is within its range. Here's the free T four. Free T four is less than Tolte four. So if you have less free, that means you have more bound. So this person has shown somewhat excessive binding. By the way, this patient was on Synthroid, I think 175 micrograms, and excessive thyroid therapy, what? Increases thyroid binding globin. So it's, it's, it's uncommon to see anybody on 100 micrograms more of T4 that doesn't have some excessive binding. I, I do rarely see it anymore, okay? So that's how you determine binding, by comparing those two. Now, some people say, have asked me, Jim, can you compare total T3 to free T3? Yes, you could if the patient's not on therapy, but there is some weirdness going on with the numbers of total T3 that once a patient's on thyroid therapy, it's no, that normal range is no longer accurate. And so total T3 will mess up your picture lots of times. So I've just cut total T3 out. Just use the total T4, and you don't have to mess with the total T3. But if you had a patient, you had a total T3 and a free T3, and they were not on thyroid therapy, you could do the same comparison. Okay, so now let's look at conversion, converting T4 to T3. The conversion occurs peripherally when the, from the free T4 to the free T3. So that's what we're going to look at, those two free levels. Excuse me just a minute. I, I just remembered I forgot to turn the ringer off on my phone, so I want to do that so we don't get interrupted. There we go. All right, so... In this patient, your free T4 is right here about 1 o'clock high. Your free T3 is down there. So I want to compare these two. Again, free T3 should be pointing in the same direction as the free T4, right there where the dotted line is. And again, put them on the same graph. Your free T4 is up here. Your free T3 is down here. What this tells me, the free T3 is much lower relative to the free T4. So it's what they are relative to each other that matters. This shows this person is poorly converting free T4 to free T3. So, in this, you know, if you remember from the last one, we talked about all the possible reasons you a person could have poor converting everything from too much alcohol, to obesity, to medications, to stress, to lack of nutrients like zinc and selenium and chromium. And so, there's lots of possibilities. And in and, and this patient, I remember, um, yeah. This guy didn't exercise, he was overweight, he drank too much, he was stressed out about his work and in his home, and yeah, he had, he had what I like to call a lot of potential for fixing, but that's why, he had multiple reasons why he was converting poorly, but that's how to identify a poor converter, okay? Now, let's talk about the free T3 and reverse T3. Again, free T3 is the accelerator of your metabolism, reverse T3 is the brake, okay? And it, it, the same rule applies. If Wherever the free T3 is within its range is where the reverse T3 should be within its range. So in comparing the two, the reverse T3 should be where the dotted line is. And let's put them on the same graph and look at them. Here's your free T3, the accelerated metabolism, way down here. Here's reverse T3, the block of metabolism, the blocker over here. That there, that graph explains to me why this patient had so many symptoms. Even though the total T4 was even higher than optimal and TSH was fine, this shows me that the patient has a lot of issues in conversion. Conversion. Now, I said earlier, I don't use reverse T3 that much anymore, and my reasons are this. Number one, very few labs do it. It involves the use of radioactive material. So most conventional labs outsource the reverse T3. I'd like to keep, if I'm comparing levels, I'd like to keep everything in-house, but it's impossible to do reverse T3. It is more expensive. It delays getting the results back. And it's not Earth-friendly because it involves using radioactive material. Well, when I found that out, when I was at DRT, a doctor's office explained, we'll never do reverse T3. It involves radioactive material. I said, well, that's not cool. I said, wonder how I can do that. Well, what I do is I go back to this, free T4 to free T3. And again, by comparing the two, this, this tells me what? The person is poorly converting free T4 to free T3. So I look at all those reasons for poor conversion and try to correct it. If I go to this, 
I have a high reverse T3 relative to the free T3. That tells me the person is poorly converting free T4 to free T3. That's why the reverse T3 is up. What's, what's, what do I do about it? The same thing. I look for all the reasons a person poorly corrected. So I now just use the free T3 to free T4 comparison in most cases and not bother with the reverse T3 because it is more expensive, it delays results, and it's not earth friendly. I have used it at times when I you know, have issues. I don't know what's going on, but um, I don't feel it's a necessity anymore. Okay. Remember that if you get excess reverse T3, it further inhibits the conversion from T4 to T3. So this does not change overnight. You start working at the possible reasons a person's poorly converting. It takes time for reverse T3 to come down. Okay, but you're you're making reverse T3 from the T4. Why you're trying to work on improving this conversion? Keep that T4 down. If you remember from the earlier graph, this patient's total T4 level was higher than optimal, and they're making and he's making reverse T3 from it. So you got to get that total T4 down. So um, what I do is, is I slow slowly lower the dose of T4 in a patient that has high T4 and poor conversion, and I will decrease it by maybe 25% at a time. You, you never want to change the dose too much. The patient reacts poorly in more cases than not, okay? And then I'll give a slow-release compound of T3 to give them more thyroid activity, okay? If they're not on a T4 preparation, just give slow-release 3. Don't give them T4. If they're not converting well, don't give them T4, okay? Even if their T4 is a little bit low, you probably want to wait till you work on the conversion because you don't want to make in reverse T3 instead of T3 from it. So keep that in mind. If a patient's poorly converting, T4 is not the way you want to go. Okay? Even the combination of T4 and T3. If you use a uh, desiccated pork thyroid, the amount of T4 to T3 is 4.2 to 1 in that. So you're getting much more T4 than you are T3, and you're going to convert that to reverse T3. So a patient might feel better at first, but then they're not going to feel good, good long term. Address the conversion. That's the underlying thing. Fix the conversion, and then you can get the T4 up to optimal levels. Okay. And again, I already talked about the excess cortisol. Remember that growth hormone increases T3 production. Okay. So if a patient's on oral estrogen, which hopefully we've got all our patients off that now, that inhibits growth hormone, so get, get rid of the oral, change the transdermal or sublingual. Um, but look at exercise and sleep and nutrition, uh, things that affect natural growth hormone in, in, in some of these patients by just getting to exercise regularly and sleep better, you get T3 production to go up because growth hormone goes up. Okay, so here's this, here's the example again. Here's what I want to point out. This patient came back to the doctor, and here's what the doctor's response, which I'm sure many doctors would respond this way. Your thyroid levels are all normal. And if you look at it, that's an accurate statement. So this patient who had pretty severe, moderate to severe symptoms of hypothyroidism, as you've seen from the example I've just shown you, was poorly converting and excessively binding on a high dose of T4, still feeling lousy, that is told your levels are all normal. That's why just looking at the levels, and, and even if you just looked at the optimal levels, you go, well, I'm not too bad. Free T4 at least is optimal. And, yeah, free T3. Negative. But if you look at them individually like we just showed and do the comparison and look to see where the problem is, do I have excessive binding, do I have poor conversion? Now you're attacking what's a problem in a majority of people. In, in my mind, the number one cause of subclinical hypothyroidism is poor conversion of free T4 to free T3. So I can get, you can see by this example, I can get my levels to look pretty good to, to what we've been trained, keep it in the normal range. With thyroid, it's a little bit different. We, we can use these same levels, look at them a different way, and that will help us determine where the actual problem lies. Okay. Now, I wanted to show you this example, and I just, I don't even know numbers, I just want to show you a diagram. This is comparing free T4 to free T3, where the free T3 is relatively high within its range compared to the free T4. Again, free T3 should be pointing in the same direction as free T3, so it should be pointing over here, okay, about uh, 10 o'clock, and it's past 12. So this is not the way it should happen. Um, because normally what you do is you convert the free T4 to free T3 peripherally among, upon demand as you need it. You use up energy in your ATP energy stores, the mitochondria, you need to restore those energy stores, and that requires free T3, so you convert. But for the free T3 to be high in the free T4 is not, a, not usual. This happens under the following circumstances. Number one, autoimmune response. 
as I explained before, when you have an autoimmune response affecting the thyroid gland, you cause inflammation of the thyroid gland, destruction of thyroid gland cells, which releases stored T4. You get a high T4, suppresses TSH. The high T4 is converted to high T3, suppresses TSH, so now you've got an inadequate amount. This is what will happen if you're at a certain point, if you get that. This happens commonly. So this that free T3 that gets produced excessively stays around for a while. So if you see a free T3 relatively high to a free T4, the first thing I look at is, first thing I would ask you if you say, hey, I have this situation, this patient in front of me, I'd say, did you check their thyroid antibody? Because I'd be looking at, at, at an autoimmune reaction. Okay. Now it could also be because of the timing of the dose. And I'm going to go over now the timing of, of testing compared to timing of the, of, of the last dose and how that's important. But uh, this patient could have been on desiccated pork thyroid and, and say they took it uh, two hours before they had their blood drawn. Well, that's when T3 is going to be peaking and, free, and, and T4 has not peaked yet. So that's why that could be off. Okay. Uh, baseline testing, I do told T4, free T4, free T3 for obvious reasons. Always do a, a CYA, I'm sorry, TPO, which I call it because it's not that useful, but it's standard of practice. You must do it. You get a lot of trouble if you're treating any thyroid patients and you're not monitoring a T, uh, I'm sorry, TSH out here to the right. TPO is the number one way to catch autoimmune reactions. If you feel that the patient is pretty good chance there's autoimmunity going on, I check both the TPO antibody and the thyroglobin antibody both. Always look at vitamin D and ferritin. I, I moved ferritin up to check everybody now. Ferritin, as I explained in previous uh, presentation lowers thyroid transportation and utilization. So it causes a symptom of hypometabolism. On the other hand, hypometabolism over time lowers ferritin. So I have just found so many patients less than optimal on their ferritin that I've basically moved it up and test everybody up front. Iodine, I don't test up front anymore. Um, if iodine is really deficient, you're, you, you won't be able to make enough. Your total V4 will be less than optimal. Okay? Um, and lots of times I, with iodine, it, it'll be, if I, if I do that, it's done a urine test. Um, I use a dried urine test um, by ZRT Labs. I think it works really well. Um, but I don't necessarily do it up front now. That's, that's kind of an option with you. If you want to test it, you can. Um, but ferritin, I've, I've just pretty much moved up front. Reverse C3, I already talked about that's optional. If you really feel more comfortable with it and you don't mind the fact that it's not earth-friendly, go ahead and run that test. But the basics of the total T4, free T4 direct, free T3 direct, TSH, TPO antibody, vitamin D, and then ferritin, and then iodine I consider optional, and thyroglobin antibody consider optional. When you do follow-up testing, I always ask myself, what do I really need? You know, if I've tested the person's vitamin D, put them on a vitamin D dose, test them several months later, and they got a great level, and I'm not changing the dose, I don't need to check vitamin D all the time. Some people say every year, some say every couple of years. I ask myself, you know, do I need to? Is there any chance it's changed here? Has the person changed a lot of weight or anything? Otherwise, I don't always test it. I, I don't always redo the total T4. If the TV, total T4 is optimal, I'm not changing therapy. I don't need to check it again. You can if you want. Lots of times I'll just use the free T4, free T3, TSH, and TPO. And then monitor the other ones if I'm in any, doing any dosage of it and any adjustments. But I use the, uh, the ZRT laboratory uh, capillary dry blood spot test for follow-up testing a lot and like it because it's really convenient for the patient to do at home and they can do it whatever time they need to do it. Okay, so when you're interpreting thyroid testing, the timing of the sample, whether it be dried blood, capillary blood, or it's venous serum, either one, the relationship to the last dose of thyroid replacement therapy is critical to interpretation results. Okay, you want to avoid peaks and valleys. And of course, if you do it right the first time, you want to keep the timing consistent. In other words, you test eight hours after the dose because that's appropriate for the, the T4 you're given. Next time, you want to test eight hours after the dose. Okay, so when do we test? When do we avoid the peaks and valleys? Well, first of all, you've got to be aware that everybody says T4 has a half-life of seven days. Okay, it doesn't make sense. It, a half-life means seven days after you give it, half of it's still there. So if I gave 100 micrograms of T4 on a Monday, the following Monday, 50 micrograms is there, still there. 
Well, in the meanwhile, I've got 100 micrograms on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. I've accumulated a lot of T4. That person's going to be toxic in two or three weeks. It can't have a half-life of seven days if we're giving it every 24 hours. Okay? I don't know how they came up with a half-life of seven days, but it had to do with the funny way they measured TSH, which isn't always accurate, and you don't see the net effect after a short period of time, but um, whatever the reason, it doesn't make sense to call it half-life seven days. What I know is that if you give a youth thyroid patient T4, you're back to baseline in about 20 hours, 18 to 20 hours. So it's not lasting that long. So I look at the duration. When it comes to testing, and I want to see a nice level response without the peak that ha occurs at first and the trough that occurs toward the end of the dosage inter interval. I want something in between where it's a nice level response. I look at the duration, okay? So the duration of T4, I look at in most cases, look at the youth thyroid patient. 18, 20 hours, it may be back to baseline. So I'm going to, I'm going to test. No, no longer than after 20 hours after the last dose, okay? T3, similar. I'm going to give you more specifics on that in just a second. It's claimed that T3 has a half-life to one to one and a half days, but it should should be dosed more often. I, and I read one says that in order to keep TSH suppressed, they had to dose it three times a day, immediate release, okay? The duration of action is four to six hours. So keep that in mind. If you're given an immediate release T3, four to six hours later, it's troughing, Okay? So, if you've passed more than 24 hours since your last dose of thyroid replacement therapy, then the resulting levels are not correlated to the dose, but instead show more of what's left that the thyroid gland is doing. In other words, patients taking their thyroid preparation, be it T4, combination of the two, every, 20, every morning, and you tell them to skip their dose the morning they test, and you're not seeing levels that result from the dosage. It's gone. What you're seeing at that time is, what is the thyroid doing at this time? So, is that good or bad? Well, if you're, it depends on what you're looking at. If you're interested in seeing what the thyroid gland is capable of doing at this point after you've changed therapy for a while, yeah, that's what you want to do. But if you want to see where your levels are correlated to the dose you're giving, you don't want to, you don't want to skip that dose. You want to look at the specific time, which is, for T4, the peak occurs two to four hours after the dose. Levels drop up in 18, 20 hours. So you want to test between 4 to 18 hours after the last dose of immediate relief T4. For T3, it's 2 to 4 hours after the last dose to avoid the peak and the drop-off. For the combination T4 and T3 IR products, which include desiccated pork thyroid, then it's 4 hours after the last dose. Any sooner, you may be peaking the T3 any, any, or peaking the T4. Any later, you may be seeing the trough from the T3. Okay. For the compounded slow-release preparation, um, technically you could say 2 to 10 hours, but compounders set a little bit higher standards, so I, I made it 4 to 8 hours because that way I can say, hey, it doesn't matter which dosage form you're using. If you test 4 hours after the dose, you're good. So if you can't remember this slide and you want to print it out and tack it up somewhere, just remember, hey, 4 hours after the dose. So if, when your patient gets their blood drawn, make sure they're doing it the proper time after the last dose or you're not interpreting it correctly, okay? Real quickly, I want to look at your thyroid replacement options. How are we doing time-wise? Yeah, we're doing good. Okay, one grain of natural thyroid, okay? First of all, I don't like to use the word natural. It's not natural to humans. It's pork thyroid, okay? There's only 38 micrograms of T4 and 9 micrograms of T3 in that 60 milligrams, which is what? 60,000 micrograms. So you have a total of 47 micrograms of bioidentical thyroid in a total of 60,000. That's a pretty darn small percentage, what, 0.00 something. So you're calling it natural? What makes up most of it? We don't know. Does it match what's in the human body? We don't know. The, the word natural is a commercial term used to say, to, used to sell product that says we're better than that synthetic stuff that's made in the lab. The sensor that's made in the lab, it's bioidentical. You know, your progesterone is, is a natural product that's converted in the lab, but you have to go in the lab to make the actual progesterone and the estradiol, et cetera. So to call these things natural and synthetic is just confusing people, and it's just a way of, of advertising your product in a way that sounds good. So I stay away from that. But using desiccated pork thyroid, um, keep in mind uh, that you have very little actual bioidentical 
hormones there, and you have a ratio of 38 to 9, which is a little bit higher than the normal ratio, but close. Uh, T4 commercial products, they may contain lactose. Oh, by the way, desiccated pork thyroid, if you look up the definition of USP, it says may contain suitable D, such as lactose, starch. So natural thyroid is not what it's quote-unquote cracked up to be sometimes. There's some patients that may not tolerate well. T4 and T3 commercial products, both have been shown to have lactose in them and can cause variable absorption problems. So there are some limitations on the commercial product. But the T3, I've never understand why a manufacturer hadn't come out with a slow-release product. I mean, it, it's, it's an ideal candidate for it, except they probably don't have to make as many strengths as they would have to make to make people happy. Okay, so um, the, the, if you're using a desiccated thyroid, Again, your ratio is 4.2 to 1, which is not always it's not physiological, not always ideal, especially if a person is not converting well. But remember, the ratio is fixed. So you can't change the ratio of T4 to T3. You can't make it. So you're testing these patients' levels, and you'd like to increase one and not the other. You can't do it if you're using a desiccated pork thyroid. You're stuck with that ratio. A fixed ratio would only work for everybody if everybody was metabolizing T4 to T3 at the same rate. Okay. Um, just some examples of different ones. Also keep in mind that thyroid USP may contain T2, T1, selenium, and calcitonin. Okay, that's good, right? Not necessarily. They may provide biological activity, but it's minimal, and the amount of these things are not identified, quantified, or standardized. So you're telling me that I'm trying to fix the function of the thyroid gland, and in giving this preparation, I'm giving things that affect the function of the thyroid gland, but I don't know how much I've given. For example, if I've got a person that's poorly converting, I want to make sure they're taking 200 micrograms or more of selenium a day. But they're taking thyroid. Are they getting their 200 micrograms? We have no way of knowing. Maybe they're getting two, maybe they're getting 200. And if you look historically on the old natural thyroid products, the T4 and T3 ratio varied tremendously until the, they made them, standardized them. But there used to be a difference of 5 to 1 from one batch to another sometimes on the ratio of T4 to T3. If the T4 and T3 can vary that much, what about the calcitonin and selenium? So if you're having problems, and I know desiccated pork thyroid helps so many patients and they do well on it, but if you're having a problem patient, consider and get away from those un, unidentified amounts of things that may be affecting the function of the thyroid gland and go with a compounded T4 and T3, which... Now you've gotten rid of everything that's, that's affecting your thyroid function other than what you can control, okay? Okay, that's all I have for this evening. That, that's going to, hey, I'm two minutes early. Um, hopefully you have some understanding of, of uh, I've got two minutes. Let me show you real quick something else. Hang on. I'm going to show you real quick this case study. Take a couple more minutes here. I'll show you how I use the uh, thyroid gradient levels. Caucasian male, works part-time as a secretary. Caucasian female, 5'3", 128, general health okay, energy low. Um, was taking Primpro one daily. Armored thyroid, one grain twice a day. Okay? I won't go over all the details of everything here, but they have a history of depression, subclinical hypothyroidism, high cholesterol, number one reason for high cholesterol, low thyroid function. So you can see already we've got some thyroid issues. Uh, I go into the lifestyle and everything like that. Um, not bad. Not bad. Pretty good diet. Exercise of some, non-smoker, very little alcohol, a little bit of caffeine. That's okay. Uh, has weight gain, hot flashes, irritability. You see here the symptoms, uh, common symptoms of, of a perimenopausal, menopausal woman. Irritability, depression, headaches. Now, the ones related to thyroid could be hot flashes, weight gain, mood swings, irritability, depression, headaches, dry skin, constipation, brittle nails, cold body temperature, even fatigue. Those could all be thyroid. Okay, but especially the depression, headaches, dry skin, constipation, brittle nails, cold body temperature, even fatigue, those all scream thyroid. Okay, so here's the testing we did. Um, yesterday I was high because they were on Primpro. Um, E1 was high because Primpro is more estrogen than anything else. Progesterone was deficient. Testosterone was okay. Uh, DHA was okay. Cortisol, okay in the morning, okay at noon, okay in the evening, a little bit high at night. Okay, so we don't see a whole lot of problems other than progesterone not balancing the estrogen, which is excessive, okay? But looking at their thyroid testing, 
Now, what I'm going to do is not read all this through the ferritin. It was 118, so that's fine. Vitamin D, a little bit less than optimal. Vitamin D, as I've mentioned, should be up 50 or 60. Not a major problem here. Vitamin B12 is not bad. But I'm going to graph out the, the thyroid peroxase uh, antibody is negative. And TSH was 2.12. I like to see a TSH around 1, and my, my range is 0 0.2 to 2.0. Okay, but I like to see it as close to one as possible. So that's a little bit higher than I like, a little bit higher than my optimal. But uh, blood was drawn eight hours after the last dose of medication, so that's good. So here's here's her uh, results grafted out using the thyroid gradient level, and that's why I just threw this up. It's not in your presentation tonight. It's just I grabbed it before we got on tonight, just so I could show you an example if I had time. The total T4 is way up here higher than optimal, and she's on her thyroid twice a day, so she doesn't need that much total T4. Her free T4 looks optimal, but look at the free T compared to the free T4. Okay. First of all, look at the look at the total T4 pointing out here. So free T4, just look at the top two. Forget the free T3 for a minute. Look at the top two. Total T4 compared to free T4. Free T free T4 should be pointing out here toward two o'clock, just like the total T4 is. Free T4 of less, that shows excessive binding. This patient's on too much thyroid therapy and it's causing a high total T4 and too much binding. So now we've got to back them down free. Free T, on, the total, uh, on the T4 they're getting, even if they weren't and didn't have any other problem. But now if you look at the free T4, free T4 is almost 12 o'clock, free T3 is below optimal. And free T3 should be right here, almost straight up. So free T3 is much less than free T4. This person is not converting well. So this is a typical example of a patient that comes in, put on thyroid therapy, they feel better for a while, then they don't feel so good because the problem wasn't that they needed thyroid. It was some other problem like poor conversion or maybe thyroid receptor function too. And this person is put on thyroid therapy. They feel better for a while and they feel worse and they get put on some more. And basically you created excess binding and you still got poor conversion. So you're making reverse T3, which is now blocking T3 more. So you basically created subclinical hypothyroidism. But that's how I would use the thyroid gradient levels. Anytime I have symptoms of hypothyroidism in the patient uh, to a moderate amount, run those labs and, and graph it out like this and it'll show you. Hopefully that helps you a little bit on that. Okay, I'm done. I'm open to questions. Thank you, Jim. Um, I just forwarded the first question to you in the chat. Are you able to see it? Yeah, all lab tests normal. Of course, we know what normal means and not comparing them. I can't comment on that. Except TPO, that is elevated. What do you recommend as treatment for elevating antibody? Um, that gets kind of complicated. The number one thing I do for a patient with any thyroglobulin or thyroprime body high is get them off gluten. In my opinion, from what I've seen clinically, it's the number one reason people have a thyroid antibody high. Um, TPO antibody is cross-sensitive to gluten antibody antigen. The antigen for thyroid prostate is cross-sensitive to the antigen for gluten. So if you're sensitive to gluten, you fire up that antigen, you fire up the TPO antigen. So that's number one. Um, now, it in my book, I have a whole list, a one-page list of things to do with autoimmune problems. Check for heavy metal toxicity. Get them on a good antioxidant, especially selenium. Um, and in this case, since you have an autoimmune reaction going on, your other levels are skewed. Remember that. You don't know when you drew that blood where in that autoimmune reaction this patient was at. Was that the point where they were expressing or, 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 or you know, fire up the antigen, you're destroying cells, you've got a lot of T4 peripherally and T3 peripherally and it looks like the levels are fine, normally they're low, or they're high and normally they're not, you don't know. You don't know where they are in their stage of autoimmune response. So it's kind of hard to judge the rest as to whether they're having binding or um, conversion issues. But what I do in these patients, since most people convert poorly, is I make sure they're on a good multivitamin. Um, and make sure they get at least 200 micrograms of selenium and 50 milligrams of zinc a day, because those are the number two nutrients. Work on their cortisol if you have any cortisol issues at all, which affect all, so much of the thyroid function. So you're addressing some of these other common problems with thyroid, but number one, work on the autoimmune. Get them off gluten. Uh, most patients will feel better in a week to two weeks as far as energy, but they have to be 100% off gluten for this to work. If that's not enough, if they get better but not great, then they may have more than one food sensitivity. At that point, you can add dairy to the list, take them off dairy too, or you can do food sensitivity testing. Um, kind of a toss-up there. 
Um, I have people that go either way. Um, I have some people that follow Dr. Alan uh, Gaby's routine where he takes them off the whole world, everything. Uh, he wrote the, the uh, book that I call the, the Bible of Nutrition, Nutritional Medicine, and he describes it in there. He takes them off of everything, and then after like three weeks, I think it is. He adds things back one at a time, but I just find it so hard to get people to get off just gluten that I can't imagine being successful taking them off this whole list of possible things to be causing it. But gluten's the number one cause of thyroid issues, so that's what I'm going to do first. Get them off gluten. Um, I strongly recommend a liver detox and heavy metal uh, testing. And then, like I say in my book, there's a page in the appendix on things you can do for addressing the autoimmune issues. Can you clarify again what tests are valid with what caveats when a patient is on T4 therapy? Okay, it's not which tests are valid and invalid based on the therapy, okay? Um, as far as invalid tests, it's the uptake and the index, never use them. They're just not accurate. Um, as far as a patient that's on T4 therapy, no matter what therapy they are, you always want to do a total T4, free T4, free T3, along with the others I mentioned. But the actual hormones, you want to do all three of those. Yeah, invalid, I would say, yeah, total T3. That's another one that's invalid. If they're on therapy, get rid of total T3. Um, but what you really want to do, if they're on T4 therapy, you want to check their levels four to 18 hours after their last dose. Okay. Let me go back and see if I answer that. So I hope I answered that. Um, I know this, this is a lot to digest at one time. It's, it's, it's not an easy thing to digest something when it's completely different from what you've been taught. So I, I, my personal physician, when I was back in Houston, and Dr. Lee, he came, came, he'd heard my lecture twice on tape or something like that, and he came to the lecture live when I was there in Houston one time. He, said, he came up afterwards and said, Jim, this is great. You look great. And I, he was the one that diagnosed me with subclinical hypothyroidism years before. He says, you're doing wonderful. He says, and what's great, he says, this is the third time I've heard this. He says, I think I'm beginning to get it now. And that's the common thing I get. Doctor, doctors tell me all the time, I had to listen to it a couple times. I had to use it a few times and learn. And, and I tell people, look, if you want to try this, graph it out, email me the results. I'll, I'll help you interpret a few of them, and then, then, it'll, then it'll be much clearer. Okay, next question. A patient states she has Hashimoto's, and yet when given low-dose thyroid, T4 and T3, she resulted in palpitation. What do you think is going on? Well, again, when you have Hashimoto's, you have an autoimmune reaction going on. Now, depending upon how long she's had it, we don't know what her capability of producing her own thyroid hormone. But if it's decent and you're giving her thyroid, the palpitation is a way of saying, I don't need the thyroid. Now, the other thing you have to interpret here is low dose. What do you mean by low dose T4, T3? A quarter grain, an eighth grain. I, in many cases, I'm starting people out on 10, 10 micrograms of T4 and 2.5 micrograms of T3 compounded because I want a really low dose. I don't need to give more than that. They just need a little boost. Um, so the palpitation, when you see signs that now, again, depends on where they are in this, it could be that, that when, when she's, destroying her thyroid gland cells and releasing a T4 and it's adding to what she's taking, that's way too much and she's getting palpitation. Or it could be the brain just reacting, to, it's just too much thyroid, period. So I would, I would, don't give her the thyroid, work on the autoimmune issue for a while. Give it a few weeks. Work, get her off the gluten, heavy metal test, all the things I just mentioned. Um, and then if you go back, um, you know, maybe just try just a little T3 with her, I, you know, because, again, we don't know how well she's converting or not. Um, but that's, you know, it's tough to say. I'd, I'd have to see the specifics, which, you, which the, the person who asked the question said, sorry, I don't have any specifics other than that. You want to email me the specifics? I'll, I'll, I can look at the specifics and then make a better recommendation. But the first thing to do with Hashimoto is get the autoimmune reaction under control, okay, and don't give thyroid any time. Yeah, it causes symptoms of hyperthyroidism because it's 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 a body saying I don't need this, or at least I don't need this much. Anybody else got a question? Yeah, there's another one there for you. Uh, it states, oh. what did you do for the last case study? 
What did I do for the last case study? Uh, okay, that's a good question. Let me uh, open that back up. Let's see, that was case study two, wasn't it? Yeah. You have to hang on a second while I get back there, and I'll show you what I did for that patient. <laughs> you weren't supposed to ask me what I did for it. Because <laughs> I was just throwing an extra there, but that's okay. That's a good question. We'll, we'll go over that. Okay. Rid of this thing over here. I'm sorry, with that thing on the side of the for the webcast, it makes it impossible to put them down. Okay, here we are on the patient. Testing treatment plan. This is what you were asking. Uh, I changed the Prim Pro to Primer and suggested that um, because you want to get them off the synthetic progestin right away. Uh, and then taper down the estrogen over time. You can't just change them to, to natural bias right away. They'll go through estrogen withdrawal, um, which I cover in one of my other webcasts uh, on estrogen and progesterone balance. Okay, so we put on the uh, patient on oral progesterone, slow release, and some DHEA, um, and we tapered their estrogen off over time before we switched them over to a, uh, a physiological bias. And there's an example of how we do that. Um, thyroid support, put them on a little vitamin D, 10,000 units daily for two weeks and 5,000 units a day. And then what I would do is somewhere down the road in three to six months when I'm drawing some other levels in the blood, I'm going to go ahead and do a vitamin. If, I, if I'm using the ZRT a blood spot for follow-up on the thyroid, you can add a vitamin D right to that inexpensively. Um, insurance should cover it. I put them on a good multivitamin, you know, a nutritional brand. I mean, they can't go to a health food store or a grocery store anywhere else and buy a multivitamin. I don't work with those people because I'm saying, I don't know what you're getting. Selenium, 200 micrograms a day. Now, I look at what's in the multivitamin. Many times they're getting 200 there. Your dose of selenium can be 200 to 400 micrograms a day. So if you need to add selenium to the multivitamin, selenium is really the most important nutritional factor for poor conversion because it affects the deionase enzyme. So I like to get them on 400 micrograms a day for a while. And then if they get 200 in the multivitamin, I'll cut the excess, the extra selenium out after two or three months. Uh, zinc, 25 to 50 milligrams a day. Again, it's usually they're getting at least 20, 25 in a good multivitamin, so I'm adding 25 to that. Um, waited a couple weeks and then reduced the armor thyroid by 25, 30% because remember this patient was told you four was too high. Um, and then I'm going to wait at least 90 days to recheck them, see where they are, and adjust the dose again. Probably going to reduce it based on... I'm going to look at the levels at that time of symptom response, but in most cases, when people are on that much, too much thyroid, it, you end up taking it down two or three times a year. That's why I tell people you have to be patient. I'm not going to fix it overnight because I got to, I, I can't reduce it by too much, and then I got to wait at least 90 days to retest. Um, this patient was having adrenal issues, so some of the things I do is adequate water intake, um, which is your weight in pounds. Divide that in half, and that's the number of ounces a day you need to consume. Uh, uh, unrefined salt, sea salt, uh, I use Celtic brand or real salt, and, and I take them at least a half teaspoon full daily more if they're really severely low on energy. Uh, adaptogen for the stress response and compensation techniques, which is a, a daily, uh, I define as something the patient enjoys doing which takes their mind off the world. So reading, prayer, meditation, yoga, walking, but without your cell phone on. Um, just get away from the world for 10 or 15 minutes, get your mind off of it. Do that daily, okay? And then protein, which is important for adrenal support at each meal and for any snacks. Um, and then it just goes on to how they changed and uh, I won't go into anymore. That's, that's just the end of it. So that's what I did. As far as the thyroid support, it was basically nutritional and addressed the cortisol issues. Okay, we have another question. A nutrition supports for T4 to T3 conversion. Um, if you, sorry, I'm. Oh, yeah. Uh, in my previous lecture, we listed a number of them. Now there are some that are definitely selenium 
there is a strong correlation between selenium and the deionase enzyme activity that converts T4 to T3. Zinc is, is pretty strongly correlated. Chromium. Um, but there are a number of vitamins, A, D, the B vitamins. There are a number of vitamins and minerals that have been suggested as possibly uh, affecting that conversion, including iodine. So what I do is I give them, as I showed you in the example just a second ago, I give them a good multivitamin, which so many people aren't on. If they are taking one, they're taking Centrum or one a day, which both in my mind are junk. I get them a good brand name multivitamin. Um, I, I use a lot of uh, Designs for Health uh, twice daily because you know, that's better than taking four capsules three times a day, which some of them do. It's one twice a day. Um, but I get them on that, and then I add the selenium and zinc to it. And that was listed in the, in the slides from the, I think, uh, part two. Um, and then you look at the, that's what basically what I do for the nutrition. Everything else is addressed. The top reasons are for poor conversion are cortisol issues, high cortisol, or previously high, and in my mind, um, poor liver metabolism, so liver detox should be considered, and nutritionally, what I just mentioned. Question, have you had any success reversing the, the orbital signs of Graves' disease? If so, how? Um, I have seen patients reverse it to some degree when they just get off the gluten. So it depends upon how long they've had it. Um, remember that Graves' and Hashimoto's are the same disease state. It's basically you've got this autoimmune reaction going on. If they catch it early, if you have a, a significant release of T4 from the destroyed cells because you have a lot of inflammation going on there, you have a hyperreaction, then they're going to test you and, and your levels are high and your antibodies are high, so you have Graves. If they don't catch it early on, then it goes on for a few years and now you're low and they call it Hashimoto's. Same difference. So, um, yeah, if you can, if you can keep those levels from going so high, stop the autoimmune reaction. If it hasn't occurred too long, you can, in some cases, uh, reverse the orbital uh, signs, but 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 probably not get it back to complete normal. Okay, another question. Uh, I see many patients with normal TPO and tyroglob antibody results, yet many experts say most cases of hyperthyroidism are due to Hashi's. Do you think that the patients are simply seronegative? Uh, you know, I recently co-lectured with Dr. Uh, Aram in, in Houston, Texas. He's the author of the book, The Thyroid Solution. And he's not being a physician who's a thyroid expert. He gets to do this to all his patients. By palpitation and uh, ultrasound, he's determined that the much higher percentages of, ha of patients that have an autoimmune reaction going on that's actually shown by the antibody. And he gave percentages, and I think it was 2 to 3% have antibodies that are high, and 15%, in his opinion, have autoimmune reaction going on. So I asked him after the lecture, I said, so tell me something. So I have a normal range of 0 to 150 for a autoimmune, TPO autoimmune response. Could it be that it should be 0 to 75? It's almost certainly. I said, so it's like the other ranges. Maybe it's too wide, and that's what he feels. And I kind of agree with that because I've had patients that I've seen in a normal range. If you use that example from one lab that uses 0 to 150 as normal, okay? I've had patients have come back at 62, okay? Most patients are down like 10, 15, if anything, zero. So when I see a 60, I go, well, it's normal, but it's higher than what I normally see. I've tracked a few of those patients, three of them now, and the TPO antibody has gone up when we retested a few months later. And I said, get off gluten. And they're off of gluten for a year, and their TPO is down to 10. So I, I really think that there's a number of people that are having this reaction that probably before their tests are abnormal. Now, I used to think, oh, I was lucky. I caught it before it got to be a real bad reaction. But from what Dr. Aram says, there's probably a, a pretty good percentage of people that are having an autoimmune reaction going on. The tests just aren't going to show it because they're, the range is wrong. So that's my opinion anyway. So, yeah, if, if you see a lot of symptoms that you think uh, imply an autoimmune issue like low energy, poor intestinal function, headaches, sinus issues, uh, weight gain, I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say, you know what, let's go gluten-free for a couple weeks at least 
and just see if there's any changes in your in your body symptoms. All right, Jim, this is our last question um, because we're at the top of the hour. So, okay, um, last question. Any advice for reversing hair loss? Uh, depends on what the hair loss is caused by. Uh, hair loss can be caused by cortisol, which is usually more clumping. Uh, low thyroid function, which I would say if it's low thyroid function is usually thinning all over. Um, in that case, you're going to go through these three presentations and fix a thyroid function. Um, if it's like a male pattern baldness, it, it, it can be too much DHT, and too much DHT to hydrotestosterone can be caused by low progesterone. Um, and there are, I have a formula that if you guys want to email me, I have a hair loss formula that I can send you that you can put on topically for those cases. And I've actually had some success. I had a doctor uh, recently at, at one of the anti-functional meetings come up and show me her husband's head and said, look, six months and it's getting fuzzy again. So, uh, but I can send you that formula. So, depending upon what the cause of the, revert, the hair loss is in the first place. But look at cortisol, look at thyroid, and look at DHT. And then I guess that's... Yeah, thank you so much. I'm going to email you any additional questions that come in. Um, okay. Audience, please feel free to continue typing them. We'll post those on our blog at powertopractice.com. That's power number two, practice.com. Um, <clears throat> also, Jim's email is on the screen there. It is jpaoletti, P-A-O-L-E-T-T-I, at powertopractice.com. And uh, please join us next month, November 9th, for another fantastic webinar, IV Nutrient Therapy 101, a primer for practitioners. And uh, you can also find a link in our blog to join that webinar and in the follow-up email that we send. Thank you very much, um, Jim. That was fantastic. Thank you. We'll talk to you next time. All right, bye. Bye-bye.